So we said that there are millions of materials to choose from. What do we do? So uh, these materials have different functionalities. So we, we were able to narrow that down uh, from millions, let's say hundreds. So uh, instead of just saying uh, I have calcium carbonate, that's one material, and then I have salt, that's another material, and then sugar, that's another material. Now I have uh, classes for them that I've, we've come up with. Some of them are heat insulators. Some of them are chemically inert. Some of them are transparent. Some of them are mechanically strong. Some of them are red or green or blue. Some of these are paramagnetic or diamagnetic, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we went down from millions to hundreds. But is that enough to go down to? So there must be another way. And there is another way. So instead of going from, from instead of having these uh, hundreds of materials, uh, properties, and classifications, there are actually four to five large categories of materials. Uh, and they are all grouped together because they all have similar properties. Not necessarily all the same, but very, very similar properties. So take three minutes now and try to figure out what these four or five large categories might be. Uh, and look around you for inspiration. So these are the these are the major four, uh, and there's a fifth one uh, that we'll discuss a little bit. There are metals, uh, ceramics, polymers, and composites. Um, and under composites, I've included nanomaterials. Uh, and there's also you can also have a fifth class of bio composites or biomaterials if you need to. But the major ones are these four, uh, where the fifth one is highly disputed. Um, and we'll just look. Let's we'll take a look at what these each of these are. Well, metals. These include all of the elemental metals. So you look at the periodic table. All these metals to the left of the bat line are all metals. Uh, and anything that you mix them together, if you mix them together in, in, in proportions, um, are also called metals. Uh, when you mix two metals together, they're called alloys. That's just a name that we have come up with 
for metallic mixtures. And in general, uh, metals uh, are considered to be good heat and electricity conductors. They are strong and ductile, and they maintain good strength over a wide variety of temperatures. Uh, as you can see, most metals are opaque. Uh, they, most of them, not all of them, uh, may oxidize and, or rust or whatever uh, word you have for that. Uh, many of them are paramagnetic, uh, meaning that they will have some sort of uh, susceptibility to magnetic field. Some of them are actually used to be magnets and permanent magnets. Uh, metals have high densities and uh, mostly they are pretty expensive because a lot of them are rare. Not all of them are rare, but uh, the one the ones that you classically think of as metals, like platinum, uh, or copper, or iron, are more expensive uh, than some other metals that you don't really think of as metals, like sodium, sodium is a metal. Uh, but they have a large uh, range in, in pricing, with the more expensive ones uh, pretty apparent, like gold and silver. Okay. Then we have ceramics. Um, these are ionic solids. So this is like salt, uh, NaCl, that is a ceramic. Uh, that's when a metal and non-metal uh, bind together. So you look at the graph table, anytime you see something that's a metal and non-metal, they will be called a ceramic. Also, um, in addition to that, uh, they're all non-crystalline, meaning that they, they, don't, they don't form crystals uh, easily. They're very glassy. Uh, they don't have a lot of order in their molecular arrangement. Uh, some of these might be crystalline, uh, like salt, uh, but the glassy ones are not. Uh, they do not have that molecular arrangement uh, that you would see in salt. So that's not necessarily going to be their defining feature. Uh, most of them are uh, insulatory to heat and electricity. Uh, they tend to be diagnetic and not respond to magnetic fields. <clears throat> uh, they have very high strengths and are very brittle. Uh, most of them are opaque, but not all of them. As you can see, glass is not. Uh, uh, most of them will dissolve in water, but again, not all of them will dissolve in water. Uh, and they have a tremendous range of prices. Some of them are dirt cheap, and some of them are very, very, very expensive. Um, so think of diamond. Uh, these are, that's much more expensive than, say, salt, uh, table salt. Okay. Then we have this new class, relatively new class of materials called polymers that we just been recently classified, or well, say in the 1930s, it's been around forever. There are some natural polymers that have been in use since the beginning of time, but uh, us as humans, we have not uh, sort of accepted the fact that polymers exist as their own class until very, very late. Uh, 1930s seems like a long time to you, but you think about all of history, that's not that long of a time to have this class of material. So you go back to the 1920s, 19-teens, they did not have plastics back then. So they couldn't saran wrap their food, or they couldn't uh, put uh, water in their, in their plastic bottle or whatever. Uh, they just didn't have these plastic things. Okay, and polymers are uh, just long chains of organic mo uh, organic monomers, and these monomers are repeating units. Uh, if you take a class on polymer science, you'll be discussing at length what polymers are. Uh, since they were pretty recently discovered, uh, there's a lot of research devoted to polymer science and new materials with polymers in it. Uh, there are some polymers that are biopolymers, like I just mentioned. Uh, so, for example, sugars and DNAs and natural rubber. And many of them are synthetic polymers. So, uh, Teflon, styrofoam, polypropylene, poly, uh, polyethylene, and things like that. So. Um, so, for example, if you look at the recycling sign on your bottle, uh, is one, two, three, four, five, six. These are all uh, classes of synthetic polymers that we create uh, and uh, are able to uh, recycle. One, for example, refers to polyethylene, and five to polypropylene, and things like that. Uh, and the reason we put it there is that we can be, we are able to, to later on uh, recycle that. And this will be the discussion that we'll have in our office hours. Uh, so again, I just mentioned that the, this field allows for a lot of uh, variation in properties because different polymers will have different properties. So think about all these different cups that you might, you might make a styrofoam cup, or you might have a, um, a, a polyethylene cup or a polypropylene cup. Um, so a yogurt container, that's a polypropylene, that's five, uh, the recycled five symbol. 
if I put hot material in that, it will melt it, uh, so I cannot put hot coffee in it. But if I take styrofoam, which is, I believe, uh, recycling sign six, uh, if I put hot, hot water in that, or hot coffee in that, that will, that will be fine for it. Uh, so depending on the use for it, um, the different uses for it. But if you look at, for example, styrofoam, if I try to bend it too much, it will break. It breaks pretty easily, whereas polypropylene it has some dip. So I can push it and prod it, and it will not break very easily. So as far as the integrity is concerned, if I want to ship yogurt containers across the country in trucks, having it in propylene is much easier for me than having it in uh, styrofoam. Uh, so the fourth class is called composites. That just means that uh, these are mixtures of two things that are uh, of the other two classes. So wood, for example, is um, cellulose, which is a biopolymer, uh, mixed with lignin, which is an organic molecule under ceramic uh, concentration, I suppose. Uh, reinforced concrete, concrete is metal and ceramic. Uh, you could think of other examples like bulletproof vests. They have ceramics and metals embedded together. Uh, these are all called composites. Uh, a fifth class that I wanted to mention is nanomaterials. So just like polymers were the big, the hot and big thing back in the 30s and 40s, the na nanomaterials and nanoscience and nanotechnology has become the big thing of the late 90s to today. And these are uh, materials that have nanometer-sized uh, building blocks, uh, and they're they're all the rage now. We're we making all these interesting new materials with them. Uh, there are our sort of subsets of the other three. So you can make titania uh, nanoparticles, for example, which you use in sunscreen. That's the major uh, component of sunscreen. Uh, but that, if you look at titania, that's just titanium dioxide, and titanium dioxide is just uh, salt, uh, and a salt, and like I said, is a ceramic, so it's just like a nano ceramic. But you can make other things. You can make uh, nano iron oxide, which an iron oxide, again, is a ceramic, but I can make nano gold nanoparticles. Gold is a metal. Or uh, nano silver or whatever, and these are different. They have different applications because of their size, not necessarily because of what their uh, uh, bulk materials and bulk properties are. Uh, 